The title of my message is Chasing God, Seeking His Face, Not His Hand. I want you to think about these three words, peace, joy, and contentment. Those three words are what most of us strive for, right? Those three words are what we want to be in our life on a daily basis. We want peace, joy, and contentment. And if you think about it, you look at peace. Usually, when you have peace, you will have joy. When you have joy, you'll have contentment. We can even go backwards and say, when we have contentment, we'll have joy. And if we have joy, it usually comes from peace. Those three words, and there's many more, but those three are a gift from God that he wants us to have. But they will only come on a daily basis if we are chasing God, seeking his face, and not his hand. I want you to take a look at three more words. Anxiety, depression, and hopelessness. Those three words are not gifts from God. Those three words come from us striving and chasing everything else but God. So today, I want us to take a look at how we can begin living our life, walking in peace, walking in joy, walking in contentment. Anxiety and depression are on the rise like never before. It just kills my heart when I talk to the teens and they start as young as third grade and they raise their hand if you say, does anyone struggle with anxiety? How do they even know what anxiety is in third grade? But we have the internet. The internet can be a good thing because as you see, I love posting photos of my family. I love connecting with all of you, with our youth group. It can be a beautiful thing, but it also can be something that causes our teens or even our young adults, even us, it can cause us anxiety and anxiety leads to depression. And once we're in that place, that's when hopelessness sets in. But God, don't you love that? But God, God will take care of all of that. But it's going to be a daily chase. How do we know that God wants us to chase him? How do we know? Well, we take a look at his word. Whenever I have questions, I go straight to God's word because in his word are all the answers we will ever need for life. And don't let anyone else tell you any different. I've spent my life searching the word of God and he's answered me through every trial and tribulation. So we're gonna take a look at Jeremiah 29, 13. You actually read this in the proclamation today, but we're gonna read it again because I really think God wants us to seek this to, to just Go deep down inside of our hearts as we seek him. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? So again, we are going to say this nice and loud. Ready? You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Think about that. All of your heart. Not a little bit of our hearts. Not half of our hearts. All of our hearts. We will find God when we seek his face. When we seek his face, we receive his favor. You may be seated. Would you all um, pray with me as we start the message? Father God, we praise you, Lord, and we all, we, we all as our church family, we want to seek you, Father. We want to chase you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just uh, fill me Flood this room, uh, transform us through your power, Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father, that in Isaiah, you always promise me that your word will never return void, but you will always accomplish what you set out to do. Father, we ask that you would do just that in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So we are also going to take a look at John verse 423. You guys can can look in your Bibles or you can follow me on the screen. I want this one to really sink in. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father 
in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Think about this. We seek God, we chase God, and he finds us. There's this game I love to play with my grandbaby. I put him out on our front lawn. Our front lawn's kind of big, and the grass is nice and smooth, and he's only one, so he just started walking. But I love to play this game with him. So I'll put him down, and I'll say, Christopher, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you, and I'll chase after him, and he will run as fast as his little legs can take him, but all of a sudden, he just stops. He stops, and he looks back, and he waits for me to catch him. So I pick him up, and I kiss him, and I swing him around, and I love on him, and I think about that. I think about, what if I just said, Christopher, I'm going to get you, and I put him down, and he started running, and I didn't chase him. And he looked back, and no one cared enough to chase him. Think about our relationship with God. Jesus is always pursuing us, always. In Revelations 3.20, he says, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come in and dine with him. So we, we ask Jesus into our hearts to be our Lord and our Savior. We open the door and we let him in. And he's sitting at our kitchen table. But do we leave him here? I'm preaching to myself today. Do I leave him at the kitchen table when something else catches my attention? When I start to chase something else, when I start to run after anything else, how does that make Jesus feel? We are going to take a look at Genesis chapter 35. And, you know, I think about the life of Jacob as we think about Jacob. Can we talk about Jacob? We've been talking about him for about four months now. We, I feel like I know Jacob. Jacob has gone from a conniver, a liar, a cheater. He, saw, he convinced his brother Esau to sell his birthright for a, a bowl of soup or a, a bowl of stew, whatever that was, but he did. Then when he met the love of his life, Rachel, he just walked up, kissed her, and then started to weep. Jacob did whatever he wanted to do. So I think about Jacob. Jacob went from ignoring God to wrestling with God. And sometimes I think it's better for us to wrestle with God than to just ignore God. Can I get an amen? amen. Because God wants us to communicate with him. So if you are here today and you are struggling and you are saying, I don't even know where to begin to chase God, and you're wrestling with him, it's okay, because God will be there just like he was for Jacob as we look at Jacob's life. Amen. So Jacob, amen. So Jacob's finally got it together in Genesis chapter 35. Can everybody say, go Jacob? go, Jacob? And now we need to say, it's about time. It's about time. <laughs> So Jacob has got it together here. So we are going to take a look. Follow me on the screen or in your Bibles. We are going to take a look at Genesis chapter 35, verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there. Build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So let's stop at this verse. Why? Why did God tell Jacob to go build an altar? Why didn't God just tell Jacob what he wanted to tell him right then? Think about that. You know, this happens to me sometimes. I'm sure it happens to you. God will give you a word or he'll give you a verse, but he won't give you the rest of the story. And you're like, God, what does that mean? What, why can't you just tell me right now? This is what God is doing to Jacob. Why? Because God wants Jacob to seek him. God wants Jacob to worship him. God wants Jacob to honor him. And our God, the God of the universe, the God who created the heavens and the earth, deserves all of our attention all of the time. And the church said, Amen. So we are going to go on. Genesis 35, 2 and 3. So Jacob said, to his household, and to all who were with him. 
Get rid of the foreign gods that you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So we are going to take a look at two things that Jacob is doing as he is chasing God. And if you don't remember anything else about my sermon, I pray that you will remember these two points. Number one, Jacob is being obedient to God. God is serious about obedience. And number two, he's getting rid of idols. I'm going to talk to you first about number one, being obedient to God. I got to tell you, it's really hard sometimes to do exactly what God tells you to do, to be obedient when God tells us to do something. It's not only hard, it's scary. And most of the time for me, it's awkward. God tells me to do really awkward and scary things. My niece, Tara, had called me um, a few years ago, and she had asked me if I would go visit her husband, Greg's father, Don. Don was in the hospital, and Tara asked if I would go share the gospel with him. Um, I know Don, but I didn't know him that well. So, I, of course, I'm going to say yes to that. I would never say no to that, ever. But, you know, I felt a little scared inside, like a little awkward, because think about this. You know, you go visit someone, and they really, you may have seen them once or twice at a family party, but they don't know you very well. So it's an awkward feeling because they're thinking, why, why is she here? That, that's, that's what I think in my head. Wouldn't you all be thinking that? Okay? You all with me? <laughs> so... I'm thinking, you know, but of course I'm going to go. So John comes with me, and um, Tara says to me, we really want you to share the gospel. We, we don't know if he's going to make it um, the, in the next couple weeks. So I said, okay, okay. We prayed. We went in. So we started our conversation, and, um, you know, I said, hi, remember me? I'm Tara's aunt. How are you? And he was very pleasant, very nice. Um, so we, we had some small talk. And I'm praying, I'm praying inside, and I'm saying, Jesus, please help me. Um, can you open the door so that I can share the gospel? Open the door for me. And um, small talk, we're talking about the kids, we're talking about the hospital. There's no open door. So I ask again, after 10 minutes go by, and I say in my spirit, God, can you please help me? And this is what I hear God say, Gina, tell him he needs to let go of his bitterness. And I said, God, this is no way to open the door for the gospel. <laughs> this is not what I was asking, okay? I don't know this man. I don't have a relationship with him. I am not going to tell this man that I don't know to let go of your bitterness. I, I, I was like, so I just kind of blocked it out. You know, here I am talking back and forth to God. And my husband's there, and we're talking. And then finally, Greg says, okay, Pop, well, I think we're going to go now. Um, you know, it was great to see you. Now I'm feeling like my heart's beating really fast. So I said, okay, God, it's now or never. And, and I'm really scared. I want you to know, because sometimes you all look at us up here and you think it's easy for us to go out and share the gospel. You think it's easy for us to get up here. It is not. We are awkward people. <laughs> or maybe just I am awkward. Maybe everyone else is okay. But I am awkward. So, but that's okay, because the Holy Spirit comes through. So, so right? So I said, you know, I, I'm praying, I'm praying. Okay, Jesus, help me. So I take his hands, and I said, Don, God gave me a message to give to you. He wants you to let go of your bitterness. And tears started to flow down his eyes. And he just started to weep and cry. And... And he said, I want to, but I don't know how. And I said, God knows how. As long as you want to, that's all that matters. And we felt the Holy Spirit flood that room. We felt his presence. And then we prayed, and, and, and we prayed, and I said, just ask, we're going to ask God together. Ask him to help you release the bitterness. So he prayed, dear God, help me 
release this bitterness. And then I said to him, Don, have you ever asked Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and your Savior? And he said, no. And I said, would you like to do that? Because he can help you. He can help you walk through this life and he can help you deal with this. And he said, yes, I would. So we prayed. He asked Jesus into his heart. The next day, his brother came and his brother was the one that he had the bitterness with. And two weeks later, he went to be with the Lord. And let me tell you, he is in heaven now. He is rejoicing. We serve an amazing God. And, and that is my encouragement to all of you. Do it awkward. So what? We're awkward, right? The Holy Spirit will come through. But obedience, obedience is important to God. The next the next thing that God is really serious about is for us to get rid of our idols. Do whatever God tells you to do and do it quickly because idols have no place in our life. What is an idol? An idol is anything that you think about more than you think about God. We all have idols. Again, I'm preaching to myself because God revealed to me the idols that I have when I was preparing this message. In Exodus 23, God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Do you think about God every day? Or do you just think about God when you need something? I mean, we're all guilty of that. The, more, the closer we get to Jesus and God, the more we think about him. But is our mind thinking about so many other idols? What are some of the idols of our hearts? Some of the idols could be our dreams, our success. Success can be an idol. We can think, I need to be successful. I need to, be, I need to have a certain amount of money by a certain amount of time. Some of the idols can even be relationships or even other people's opinions of us. Our ministries could be an idol. But we need to get rid of them because God is serious about idols. Isaiah 44, 9. All who make idols are nothing, and things they treasure are worthless. Those who speak up for them are blind. They are ignorant for their own shame. My encouragement would be to us today to ask God, what are the idols of our heart? And why? Why do we feel we need them? I think that we are always feeling that we aren't enough. And that's why we are always chasing after so much to make us feel that we are enough. You know, we are enough to God. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am enough for God. Now turn to your neighbor and say, isn't that all that matters? So we're going to take a look at what God taught Jacob and, and how Jacob's life was blessed through God teaching him about idols. Genesis 35, 4, so they gave Jacob all the foreign idols they had and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak of Shechem. Why did Jacob bury his idols? He buried them to separate himself and his family from these idols. Moms, dads, grandmoms, grandpops, aunts, uncles, we all love our family. But we need to take the lead sometimes, and we need to separate idols from our family. And you know what? What I would like to do, I like to declare God's blessings in place of those idols. I like to declare God's blessing over my family, over this church family, because I believe that when we declare the word of God, we see God's power take place. Any strongholds that we have Idols could even be addictions. Idols can be pornography. Idols can be that person that you can't stop thinking about, that you're not supposed to be thinking about. But you know what? 
They can be broken, guys. You don't have to live with them. Just like Don said, I don't know how to get rid of my bitterness. You may not know how to get rid of your idols. Just go to God. Ask him to get rid of them for you. So we're going to continue. Genesis 35, 5 to 7. Then they set out, and the terror of God fell on the towns all around them so that no one pursued them. I want to stop here. After Jacob was obedient, after he asked his family and those in his community to get rid of the idols, he could walk freely, and God took care of his enemies. Because when we see God's face, we receive his favor. We don't have to do anything else. All God is calling us to do is to seek his face. Start chasing and pursuing God, and God will chase away the devil and all of his demons from your life. Amen? Amen. So Genesis 35, 9 to 13. After Jacob returned from Padam Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. Here we go. God's blessing Jacob again. God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. Israel means one who prevailed with God. Jacob went from being a conniver, a cheater, someone who wrestled God, to someone who now prevails with God. How awesome is that? Can we give a praise to God? <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Jesus. He's just amazing, isn't he? So he named him Israel, and God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and community of nations will come from you, and kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, remember Jacob, your grandfather Abraham, and your dad Isaac? Do you remember Isaac who declared God's word over you and said you were going to go forth and have this land? Do you remember? Well, the land I gave to them, Jacob, I'm giving to you also. I will give this land also to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at that place where he had talked to him. You see... Jacob didn't start out chasing God. He ignored God, and he wrestled with God. But when he started chasing God, God found him, and God transformed him. Don't chase your dreams. Chase the one who gave you those dreams. Seek God's face, not his hand. Seek the blesser, not the blessing. If we want peace, joy, and commitment, we need to start today and do everything that we can to seek God and to chase him. Because when you are in the presence of the almighty God, everything changes. I want to, amen. 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 I love when you all agree with me. Amen. <laughs> So I'm going to show you a real short video right now. I was watching this movie the other night called One Night with the King. It's the story of Queen Esther, and most of you know this story. Queen Esther was an orphan girl. She was raised by her cousin Mordecai. Um, she was being prepared to be the queen with the king of Persia. But Mordecai found out that Haman, one of the rulers, wanted all the Jewish people in the kingdom killed. He wanted them completely murdered all of them. So, so Mordecai says to Esther, you need to go to the king and you need to talk to him because we need to do something. God wants us to be able to save these people from being killed. And Esther's scared, just like any of us would be. Esther says, I can't go before the king. If, I, if you, anyone um, appears before the king without being summoned, they instantly are killed. And Mordecai says to Esther, Deliverance will come. Our God will bring deliverance. But maybe, maybe you were brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. So this video is of Esther running toward the king. And I want you to think about yourself 
being Esther, okay? I want you to picture yourself running toward our King, Jesus, through all the battles that you are facing right now, because we are all facing battles. As, as I pray with a lot of you, I know there are some of the things, and I am so amazed at your faith and how you guys are, are chasing God through all of the pain that some of you are going through. And, and I am so blessed that, that I get to be part of someone who can pray with you. But I want you to think of yourself now running, running toward the king where you're not going to give up and you are going to make it. You're going to get to him. So as we play this video, think of yourself and think of Jesus with the opposition that is against us. Quickly. The letter will be here any moment. No leader is gone. What? I do not know the true plan, but... The king leaves for the outpost within the hour. I have not time to wait up his reign. They are not going to allow you to kill yourself. No. Please tell me he would not. What possible insurance do you have? He would lower his scepter to spare your life. You do not go into a bedroom of a mine. You go into a hall of a king. This is not you against him. This is you against protocol. You against the empire. Then I, I... I go as... David did. Before Goliath and the Philistines. Those are just stories, Esther. Do you hear me? Just stories. No, you... Most about the story of David and Goliath. David's victory came not because he fought well, but because he believed well. Thus I leave you on this day, your regent in my absence, Lord Haven, Prince of the Base. It is my will that each of you obey him in every way exactly as you would regard your king. Before the king. She does. Is protocol not broken? Yes, protocol has been broken.
some of you are running through a storm right now. And you look a mess like Esther. You've been running through the wind and the storm. And I know some of your story is so I'm trying to keep it together. I know, I know the pain that you're going through. But she made it, guys. She made it with the enemy and all that he's doing to us and all the fiery arrows that he, he shoots against us. She made it because she ran to the king. You're going to make it too. You're going to make it too. Just like the king, he stopped it. Sometimes it may feel like the very last second that he stops the sword from taking you down. He held out a scepter. And our King Jesus is waiting there for you. He's not going to let you go down. Not if you love him. Not if you chase him. It doesn't matter how what, what, the past, what your past was, because Jesus only cares about you. He cares, amen. He cares about your future. He cares about your relationship with him. So my encouragement to you, last time I encouraged you to love fearlessly. This time I'm encouraging you all to run fearlessly. And if you can't run, because there have been times in my life that I couldn't run to God, I crawled to God. You can crawl, but you can get there. And if you don't understand anything that we're talking about, and you're saying, I don't understand because I don't have a relationship with God, we talk about it here so simple. It's so simple. Simple as A, B, C. Admit that you're a sinner. We are all sinners. Believe that God did something through his son, Jesus Christ. He took our place on that cross. And see, commit your life to him. But we're going to take it a step further today. We're going to stand. Would you all stand? We are going to pray this prayer out loud for those who haven't prayed it so that we can make them feel comfortable. But for those of us who want to give up our idols and we can't, we are going to pray right now together as a church family that God, God would show us what they are and that he would take them away. So if you would bow your heads. Repeat after me, as loud as you can. Father God, thank you for chasing me. Thank you for pursuing me. And thank you for forgiving me. Father, I ask that you would forgive all of my sins past, present, and future. Lord Jesus, please come and live inside my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Father, please take away any idols that are in my heart. Anything that I chase more than I chase you, bring to my awareness and forgive me. Holy Spirit, give me the power through your presence to live my life chasing the God of the universe. Amen. Give God a hand.